The president-elect will meet tomorrow with 2012 GOP nominee and harsh critic Mitt Romney. Vlad and Christine, we are told the president-elect harbors no acutely hard feelings and likes the symbolism of party unity. But a cabinet position for Romney is, well, extremely unlikely. Major, you mentioned some of Senator Sessions' controversial positions in your piece. How much power would he actually have, if confirmed, to sort of change the way the country deals with some of those issues? Well, look, as Attorney General, you oversee the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department. You set the priorities for that Justice Department Division on Civil Rights and are in charge of making sure that all existing civil rights and voting rights laws in this country are enforced to the fullest. And that level of priority is a key aspect of whatever any attorney general brings to the job. Now, you can't change the laws of the country. Only Congress can do that with the president's signature. But you can prioritize as you see fit. And during the confirmation hearings for attorney general, I guarantee you, Senator Sessions will be asked about how he will prioritize voting rights and civil rights enforcement. He'll be asked about cases either pending or recently dealt with by the existing Obama administration Justice Department. This will be given a full conversation and review during the confirmation process. Getting back to retired General Michael Flynn, Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer questioned about him today on NBC. Here's what he had to say. Before making a decision, I want to hear what he has to say, etc. Obviously, the Senate doesn't have a say in this, but we'll be asked our opinions, and uh, he's got to uh, lay out his views for the American people. That's only fair. What, what do you? So there is something you need to hear from him. What does that sound like? Is it a well, personal meeting some, with he's, you? He said some very troubling things that I'd want to ask him about. I would assume one of those troubling things is when, uh, saying that fear of Muslims is rational. Do you believe that is a disqualifying remark if he doesn't walk that back? I'd certainly give him the chance to explain it, but it's very, very troubling. All right, so the senator rec recognizing there that Flynn does not need congressional approval, but what does this say really about uh, the relationship with Democrats on Capitol Hill? Well, that it's off to a rocky start, and I don't think that should surprise anyone. Uh, Donald Trump, as a candidate, made it clear he was going to ruffle feathers of Democrats and Republicans. And he's come to Washington with what he considers to be, and those around him consider to be, a mandate to do just that. He also, on the campaign trail, made it absolutely clear. And Michael Flynn is someone who was a warm-up act speaker for Trump many, many rallies I attended, made it also clear that they were going to take a different approach to the question of counterterrorism activities, what they believed was the root cause of much terrorist activities across the globe and threatening the United States, radical Islamism, as they say, and as Michael Flynn said repeatedly. And they're going to take that issue into the White House and take that approach into the White House. Now, to be fair to General Lynn, when he was an intelligence gatherer and a gatherer of teams to carry out counterterrorism missions in Iraq and Afghanistan, he was very successful. And he rose in the military because of that success. So he doesn't just have a theoretical approach to this issue. He has a practical experience in the two most relevant theaters of combat for U.S. military personnel, Iraq and Afghanistan. So that is something that will be taken into account as well. But he is the national security advisor of President-elect Trump. And until he leaves, there's nothing the Senate can do about it. So they can ask questions and raise issues. But this is a pick entirely left to the president-elect. And when he becomes president, General Flynn's job will be national security advisor, which means you are the White House choke point. You are the pivot, the fulcrum, if you will, of all power that radiates from the White House in three directions, State Department, intelligence community, and the Pentagon. It's a very big job, and a strong personality can make it an even bigger one. And it will be up to General Flynn to either be or not be that strong personality and be a very thorough organizer of that process. One bit of criticism that has been visited upon General Flynn's military career is that he was not always the best manager of people. And operationally, he was a success, but organizationally, he was less successful. 
Major, I want to get your take on Trump's future White House chief strategist, Steve Bannon. He gave an interview, an exclusive interview, we should say, to The Hollywood Reporter. I want to read to our audience what he had to say in part. The media bubble, this is quoting here, the media bubble is the ultimate symbol of what's wrong with this country. It's just a circle of people talking to themselves who have no effing idea what's going on. If The New York Times didn't exist, CNN and MSNBC would be a test pattern. The Huffington Post and everything else is predicated on The New York Times. It's a closed circle of information from which Hillary Clinton got all her information and her confidence. That was our opening. Sure, that is not a comment or observation about the American media as concentrated on the East Coast of the United States that is particularly new or original. I've heard that criticism of the mainstream media, the dominant media culture for the better part of my now 30-year career in Washington, D.C. So that's not an original thought. What makes it original and powerful or originally powerful is that Steve Bannon is now the chief strategist to a president-elect of the United States. And his interpretation of this bubble, this closed conversation among editors, reporters, et cetera, et cetera, for him and for the president-elect he serves and the president he will serve has relevance. It has meaning. And the way Steve Bannon will suggest the president-elect and the president communicate with the country will be filtered through this assumption that not only is this a closed conversation, but it is essentially a meaningless one, that whatever the editorial boards of newspapers around the country think is irrelevant, that whatever the New York Times or the reporters that follow its reporting believe is also irrelevant. And he will tell the, the president-elect and the president, your campaign success proves that. So don't pay any attention to that, or if you do, be disdainful of it. That is going to be one of the approaches that Steve Bannon will bring to a lot of different issues when he comes to the White House. There's also something else worth noting in that article. He denies that he is a white nationalist. He calls himself an American nationalist, an economic nationalist, all in favor of doing whatever is required to create more jobs and more meaningful employment for the vast middle class and the underclass in this country. Some of that will sound familiar to Democrats. Infrastructure spending, being much more skeptical of free trade and the forces of globalization. But Steve Bannon does in this article take on questions raised by his stewardship of Breitbart that legitimately leave in some people's mind, are you a racist? Are you a misogynist? Are you worse? Bannon addresses that as well. Major Garrett in Washington for us. Thank you, Major. Sure.